Hello, hello, and welcome to another Eyes to the Sky video. Today I would like to talk to you about high shear, low cape tornado events. This is something that uh, has been in the meteorological literature for uh, decades. It's been discussed, and, and there's been a lot of papers and things written, um, a lot of literature that's been written, research that's been completed um, concerning uh, HSLC uh, tornado events over the past few decades, especially over the last 15 years. And Matt, Dr. Matthew Parker and Dr. Keith Sherburn uh, have been some of the leading leading authors uh, concerning this high shear low cape research. They're from North Carolina State University. And when Dr. Sherburn was a graduate student um, back at uh, under Dr. Parker at NC State, I believe starting about uh, 10 years ago, eight to 10 years ago, um, when he's completing his doctoral studies, I believe there, and masters, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, did some excellent research um, on high shear locate tornado events. And there's actually some papers um, in the literature that you can go check out. Um, just type in Sherburn and Parker, uh, Parker and Sherburn uh, high shear locate tornado events, and you'll find lots of stuff on there. They have a high shear locate tornado forecasting index called the Sherby and the Sherby 3. Um, just got done doing a little bit of research on that. A little bit of review. I had read about it before, but anyway, to make a long story short, <clears throat> um, the uh, those two indices are really good at picking up on high shear locate tornado events, as is the vortex value, which I began developing back in 2016 when I was working at UAH um, under VSE. So anyway, um, I wanted to just run through some um, high shear locate tornado events with you today. I've got a list here that I'm going to just uh, fly through here. This is totally unscripted. Again, a lot of my videos are that way. I don't, you know, do a lot of graphics or anything. I, I might start working on that a bit. But anyhow, let's just breeze through some cases. I've got um, seven cases that I'd like to go over with you. The first one is November 27, 1988. And this uh, F4 tornado happened in Raleigh, North Carolina. And as you can see right here, uh, here's the, this, by the way, this webpage is the SPC, the Storm Prediction Center, the NOAA Storm Prediction Center, a violent tornado uh, database and if you'll just go to Google and type in SPC violent tornado database you, the, this will come up and you'll be able to cruise through here and look at the dates and everything and uh, different tornado events and if you'll hit build you can overlay the parameters kind of like I've done here here I've got surface base cape with um, the tornado tracks from the event um, laid on superimposed onto that so uh, less than 250 joules per kilogram for this particular date, November 28, 1988. You can see the F4 tornado that went through Raleigh-Durham. I um, believe it grazed the Raleigh International Airport um, and a RDU. And there was uh, an issue with the radar that evening. They, they had a part that broke and they had to contact the NOAA parts warehouse. And the radar was not performing. Uh, very well that evening. I believe it may have actually been down. So, and they had to get backups, I think, from either Wilmington, I believe it was Wilmington, uh, to, in order to see the supercell. So anyway, uh, it's a really fascinating story. Um, the, the RDU radar, I believe, was out. And if you can imagine, in this kind of environment, you're not really expecting an F4 tornado um, unless you've, you know, really interrogated the environment, and perhaps then you might be expecting something similar. But Anyway, the, the point is that this is a hard to to pick up on case with cape of less than 250 joules per kilogram. So uh, you can see there an F4 tornado and a couple of lesser ones. Uh, let's move on. December 24, 1988. This is one of my favorite cases. This case was actually um, the Christmas Eve, obviously 1988, in Franklin, Tennessee, Williamson County, Tennessee. You can see there, there's your 250 joule per kilogram contour of surface base cape. And look at that, folks, that, that is just, it's remarkable how things like that can happen and how ideal the wind profile has to be in order to allow for something like this to happen. And um, you can see there, I, I would assume, I believe I pulled up the sounding from this one. Um, I'll do a more detailed study down the road and show you some soundings and, and stuff that I've done. But I believe the cape was around 100, 120 or so. And the um, best lifted index, that's something Fujita did, you know, back in the, in the late 60s. 
um, or what I like to call the level of maximum buoyancy, a lifted index, um, is uh, around negative one and a half for this case. So really high storm relative felicity, I believe it was like 430, 450. So again, high shear, low cape, and that's why we call it that. Uh, moving on to another case, uh, February 1992 in Van Wert, Ohio. Let me try to remember the date. I believe it was February, February 18, 1992. I guess it's the only one in February, so it's obvious. Uh, Van Wert, Ohio, uh, northwestern Ohio there, I believe just south of Defiance. Um, 250 joules of kilogram, uh, excuse me, 250 joules per kilogram of cape. Um, as many of you know in the weather field, weather community, joules per kilogram, that's just a, an estimate of the buoyancy. It's just a ma uh, measure of the physical energy, potential energy. Um, it's, th it's the same as meters squared, second squared. So a little virtually needless fact there. But anyway, uh, the F4 tornado occurred within the 250 joules per kilogram Cape contour right there. So the Cape was somewhere between 250 and 500. I mean, just say something like 350, 375 probably. Um, so an interesting case. This was actually the narrowest violent tornado that I'm aware of. I believe it was uh, 30 yards or something, 30 to 35 yards, maybe 40 yards. Um, I believe there's a little bit of a discrepancy there between Grisoulis, uh, Grisoulis, Tom Grisoulis's database and the NOAA database, but somewhere between 40 and 60 yards, I believe, is the width. So very narrow, uh, definitely shy of 200 feet wide. Um, but yet an F4 tornado in far less than 500 joules per kilogram cape. High shear low cape, no doubt. February 6, 2008. I'm going to move on here. Um, let's see here. Okay, here we go. February 5th. And then this is Super Tuesday, obviously. Then we'll need to go forward to, I believe, the 12 UTC uh, time plot for the tornadoes. And you can keep the build down. Uh, it should have cape. Yeah, here's cape still there. So here's your 250 joule per kilogram outer contour. Look at that. That is just remarkable. I pulled some um, some wrap data from this and plotted it. I'll have to show this sometime, but I believe the um, the cape was concentrated obviously south of, of 500 millibars, south of about 18,000, 20,000 feet. And the best lifted index in this case, I believe was down around 700 millibars, um, maybe 750, and I believe it was negative three. So, that just shows you that you can have relatively fat cape for the environment, relatively fat cape, um, in, in an environment with very low cape. So that was obviously this situation, two F4 tornadoes in North Alabama that happened between 3 and 5 a.m. I remember this day really well, and the sirens went off, the civil defense sirens, the tornado warning sirens, outdoor sirens, in Huntsville and woke me up um, in, in, my, you know, in my room there at about 3 a.m., 4 a.m., as this supercell was coming into Madison County, Alabama. And I got up, and it was, you know, the dew point was unbelievably high for early February. It was like 69 degrees, 70 degree dew point. And so, uh, thankfully, the tornado didn't come through Huntsville, but that's that event. All right, we'll cover, we'll cover a couple of more events. Um, let me see. I was going to talk about the Newburgh, uh, Evansville, Indiana event from November 6, uh, 2005, but I chose not to. That was just south of 1,000 joules per kilogram, but still, you know, it, um, it, it definitely shows that you have a wide range of Cape values, guys, where these uh, intense to violent tornadoes can happen. And that's really the take-home message here is if the Cape seem like they're running a little shy of what you might think um, will allow for, a, an intense, strong to violent tornado, you know, EF2, EF3, even EF4. Um, don't discount the threat for intense tornadoes, uh, significant tornadoes. Always interpret or always interrogate every environment on its own. Don't just assume. Look at all the parameters. Try to weigh it out. Look at the overall pattern that you've been in weather-wise over the past two to four months. How have the events been performing? Um, and try to assess the, the situation on a holistic basis. Try to take in all the information that you can to make the best forecast that you can. And if you do that, I'm pretty confident, I'm very confident you'll be successful. Uh, we do it a lot, you know, with the vortex value and, and predict these high shear low cape events. And just the opposite, the, the, um, the high cape low shear events, like you see a lot of times in the Great Plains. 
Um, you can you can get those. So either way can be tricky. You guys know that. Um, so anyway, moving on. The last one that we're going to look at today, February 29, 2012. And I've actually got this information pulled up from the SBC Mesoanalysis Archive. And no, excuse me. No, no, we're going to back up. This is Adairsville, Georgia from uh, January 30th of 2013. And there was an F3. Adairsville, Georgia is right here, right in the 250 joules per kilogram of ML cape. Remember, this is mean layer cape, not surface base. There's there's uh, some debate on which one is better to use in these high shear low cape environments. Some people prefer to use the SB cape, and that's probably actually the better choice. Um, the surface base parcel um, because you can have really sensitive surface conditions that can uh, affect your cape values uh, pretty significantly. Just a degree or two of dew point can greatly affect uh, how high your cape is. Remember, your bang for your buck is going to be greater with a dew point increase or decrease as opposed to a temperature uh, flux or change. You might get two to three times the amount depending on the, the dew point value you have your mixing ratio, you know, curve. But uh, many times you'll get two to three times the amount of cape increase with an increase in dew point as you would with the same amount of temperature increase in degrees Celsius. So anyway, I don't want to go off the beaten path too much, but this is ML cape, surface cape, base cape is probably very similar. And you have 250 joules right at Adairsville, Georgia um, on this uh, January 30, 2013. High-end EF3. I believe the rating was 160 miles an hour, and it really tore Adairsville up, unfortunately. And I believe one person was unfortunately didn't make it uh, from that. Um, anyway, the warnings were good. The, the forecasters at the National Weather Service in Peachtree uh, anticipated this. They saw it on radar developing. They got the warning out with like 10, 10 to 15 minutes of lead time. So kudos to them. Great job on that. But uh, you can see here 250 joules per kilogram of CAPE. And if we look at the storm relative felicity, just to give you a little bit more background on the environment, 400, um, this is 0 through 1 kilometer, uh, meter square, second square, about 400. There might have been a spike of 430, 450 in here somewhere. Um, but just to give you a little bit more background on the environment. One other environment I want to cover with you before I let you go today is the, let me get my dates right, February 29, 2012. This was a series of intense tornadoes. Uh, with one F4 tornado in southern Illinois and northeastern Missouri, I believe. Let me make sure. Yeah, that's the date. So we'll go up here, click this one. Yeah, if you haven't checked out this browser, it's really nice. It's got a lot of capability there for you to investigate tornado environments. We'll click Build so that we can overlay the tornado tracks. And you can see there, let me zoom in a little. I hope the zoom hasn't been terrible, but let me give you a little bit more of a close in view. Okay, so here's an F4 tornado right here. Um, you can see, I believe that tornado intensity scale, the Fujita scale legend. Yeah, dark blue is F4. And you can see there a cyclic supercell moved through a couple of them, actually. Right on that, it's probably right along the warm front. So you're going to have enhanced uh, kinematics, low-level kinematics, uh, storm relative felicity, low-level bulk shear, etc. Right there along that, especially the storm relative felicity will be enhanced with the turning the backing of the wind with height with the warm front. So, excuse me, the veering of the wind with height or the backing with uh, horizontal time and, and, and uh, space there. Horizontal space and time. So, backing wind profile on the warm front, uh, but look at the cape, 250 to at most 500 joules per kilogram. And this F4 is actually just north of that 250 contour there. So, I'm sure the warm front, you know, your surface lows probably back in here, uh, classic Arkansas low pressure track, and then your warm front's probably up like this. So yeah, lots of low level stretching of pre-existing vertical vorticity. There again with those low level kinematics probably really roaring. Um, matter of fact, we can check on that real quick. Let's go ahead and overlay. If you go to wind shear, you can click on, they only have zero through three kilometer storm relative velocity. Yeah, really high. So it looks like 400 right in through there where that F4 tornado was. I believe it was Southern Illinois right there. So I think the legend, yeah, about 450 or so, you can see this contour comes around. 
450 to 500 uh, with the storm relative felicity 03. So yeah, guys, I just wanted to real quickly give you this video. I hope it's helped. And uh, I'll be making more stuff soon. I've been busy recovering from COVID and all that stuff, so I've been feeling a whole lot better. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the February 17th, uh, 2022 severe weather event that's expected across the Mississippi, Tennessee valleys uh, here, lower Mississippi, Tennessee valleys coming up. I might do that video later today or tomorrow. So thanks, y'all, and have a great day. Bye-bye.